Welcome back to the Demystify Side podcast. I'm your host, Anastasia. I'm Michael Shiloh. And today we have with us Diana Walsh Pasulka, who is a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina. And her most recent book, American Cosmic, is all about the religious aspects of UFOs. And we talked to her about the kind of perplexing journey that she went on while writing the book because she started from a place of, I would say, skepticism about the phenomenon and about all of the discoveries and about what it entailed in terms of our relationship to the cosmos. And she ends her work with a much less skeptical perspective because of what she's seen, who she's talked to, and the experiences that she's had. And we unpack all of that on the podcast. We talk about the roots of belief, the nature of mysticism, what the alien phenomenon and what belief in aliens means for us humans and how it mixes with our perplexing technological landscape. And it was... It was really fascinating. She's she's so well read and has so many interesting insights that I just I think you're going to love it. And I think her research has given her another interesting and unique insight into the way that information is managed in our modern landscape, which is something we're deeply interested in and how the search engines have failed us in some respect but how these new technologies are coming online and how decentralized those technologies may prove to be. And I think that this is where we really get our gears spinning about what the future might look like in a way that isn't completely apocalyptic. So if you enjoyed the podcast, leave a comment. If you've done that, tell a friend. We grow through word of mouth because for some reason we don't hit the algorithmic sweet spot in order to be distributed widely. And so a personal recommendation is the absolute best thing that you can do. And if you've already done that, consider joining our Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash demystify If you join up for, I think, as little as $3 a month, you get early access to episodes. So you get the two episodes we release every week on Saturday afternoons, I'll say conservatively. And then we have our weekly patron chat, which is also a really incredible thing where people who listen to the show and are interested in the topics that we discuss basically come and have a freeform discussion where we just dig into the details and see what everybody's thinking and where their curiosities lie. And so it's really where we get a lot of inspiration for what for what the project looks like. And so we'd love to have you if you wanted to join us. Yeah, join the board of directors, please. Come help us out. And enjoy this conversation. It was a really good one. And hopefully we'll be having her back in the future, hopefully with some of her friends. And let us know what you think. We'll see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. Multiple times over the course of the last few years as the UFO phenomenon has gotten to be more and more popular, it has struck us as a deeply religious event. Obsession. Yeah. And and it ties into all of these, The I think that it ties into the crisis of meaning that people are going through, where as you, as you see a decline in religion, there's no longer an entity that is above you and beyond you that you, that you have to put yourself in context with. Mm-hmm. And then you, so you see this kind of this, this decline in meaning that comes from participating in something as structured as a religion. And now the UFO phenomenon seems to come through and to give people something like that again. And I feel like you're one of the few people who's looking at it through that lens. Yes, I think so. And um, it, well, people in, so religious studies, if I can describe what we do in religious studies. So I started out in philosophy and I moved into religious studies because I enjoy doing what's called field research. So that is, you know, philosophers tend to get an idea like a paradox, a Zeno's paradox or something like that. And then they think it through and they present it to communities of other philosophers. And it's, it's very conceptual. And I always thought it was interesting to, to go into communities where, you know, I had questions about, say, what they believed or their practices and, inter, you know, basically embed myself in those and then come up with, you know, publications about it or whatnot, you know, just that's how it's almost like applied philosophy. But religious studies is a discipline and 
we we are all kinds of different. We're, it's an interdisciplinary discipline. So in my department, we have archaeologists, we have sociologists, historians, people who do redaction criticism, which is basically looking at old documents and figuring out where the oral traditions were and where like, you know, theological writing then comes in and and maybe changes an event of the past and creates dogmatic interpretations and, you know, these kinds of things. So um, we're not religious. Sometimes we are, but it's a, it's, it has nothing to do with our scholarship. And I think a lot of people, and sadly, a lot of faculty and people in various other disciplines, they don't actually understand what we do in religious studies. So I just wanted to point it out. Um, That's really cool. Do, do you have some other examples? You said you embed yourself in these communities. And obviously, the UFO community is the subject uh, of this book that we were just looking at. And were there some other precursors to that? Some other communities? That, yeah, yeah. Can you yeah, tell us a bit about that? So I started off by embedding myself within communities who would look at, um, who were d devotees of the Virgin Mary. And they believed that, you know, the Virgin Mary apparitions, it's, it's a worldwide phenomena. And I wanted to understand this and I thought it was fascinating. And so I would travel to various places where an apparition, like an apparition site, and I talk to people. Um, I actually presented this. I don't know if you know who uh, Donna Haraway is. She is a, um, she's one of the first, uh, she, she wrote the Cyborg Manifesto in the 1990s. And she was, she's at, I think she's still there, but she may, she's retired. Um, she's at the History of Consciousness program at UC San, Santa Cruz. Um, it's a very famous program. Again, very interdisciplinary. Um, and I wanted to go to graduate school there because I wanted to work with her because I really liked the way that she used social theory to look at technology and how technology was really going to decentralize a lot of things. One of the things that would decentralize, according to her, it was going to remove these binaries that are not natural, uh, human and nature, man and woman, you know, these kinds of things. So she was destabilizing those. And that was a long time ago. And I really was inspired by her work. She worked with um, Judith Butler. And there was a group of them who worked together in the Bay Area. And I, I was from that area. So this is what, so I wanted to bring my Virgin Mary scholarship to this graduate program. So I went to talk to her. Um, I had just graduated as an undergraduate and I had a meeting with her and I told her what I was going to do. I was going to use maybe like Freud or some kind of psychoanalytic framework. And I was going to look at, you know, these people who were believing that they were in contact with the Virgin Mary. I mean, it looked like something absolutely real was happening. So that's what really drew me in. And she actually told me that that was a really bad idea. She said, why would you use a Western framework to understand another culture's religious experience? That's colonialist, right? And I was, I felt really, um, you know, I was, I realized she was right. And she actually asked me a question. Now she, I was never, I never went to that graduate program. Okay. But she asked a question, which then became formative of all of my scholarship. And it's this question. She said, and by the way, at the time, I, I didn't have any answer to the question whatsoever. She said, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what happens when those people are looking at the Virgin Mary. You know, this is an apparition. So this is a visual event. She said, look, think about that. And I was thought about it. And I was like, okay, what's going on there? And then she said, think about when you watch a movie. She said, what's happening to you when you're watching this movie? And I thought about that. And I thought, okay, what's the connection? I didn't know it at the time. I was completely clueless. And so she just left me with that. Okay. So that was kind of spurred me on. Um, I always thought that maybe she was just didn't like that project. And maybe she asked me these questions to kind of divert me and, and send me away. But actually, these are very, very deep questions. Because then what happened was that I moved from communities of people who were devoted to the Virgin Mary and would, you know, go to apparition sites to actually working on movie sets. And I worked on movie sets 
strangely, <laughs> not really strangely, uh, the way it worked out was, was strange, but um, it makes sense if you look at what I do. So he's asked to be a history consultant for the Conjuring franchise. And the Conjuring franchise, if you don't know, or if people are unaware, is actually, it's a movie about the supernatural. It's one of the third largest grossing movies about the supernatural. Now, I knew nothing about this when I worked on the first Conjuring. Nobody knew it was going to be this giant franchise. Uh, James Wan was the director. And so they, I had just started to think about films about the supernatural and how these played a very significant role in belief, belief about the supernatural. So I had, I was already thinking along these lines and I had been thinking about say the Blair Witch Project and the ways, the techniques that those graduate student producers used, uh, you know, these techniques to create a sense of realism around the Blair Witch Project. I just happened to be a graduate student when it came out and they caught me in this stealth advertising campaign because I lived in California. So they actually um, got the email lists of a lot of graduate students at say UC Berkeley and Stanford and, and, they, and before the movie was actually advertised, they sent us uh, uh, emails that basically said, you know, these grad students were caught in the forest and they were never found. And, you know, so we didn't know whether to believe it or not believe it. We were totally fascinated. I didn't believe it, but I also had never been the, the target of stealth advertising before. So I was, you know, there were lines around. We, it took us three days to get tickets to the Blair Witch Project. So that really never left me. That idea that, that you know, people were caught in this, this um you know this kind of conundrum of is this real or is this not real so when i became as an assistant professor when i went on set of the conjuring i just happened to be an expert in traditionalist catholic communities and the two the people uh ed warren and lorraine warren the people that are the you know the main characters in the conjuring franchise they were traditionalist catholics so i had a unique perspective and you know a skill set to help the producer and the screenwriters and so i also thought this was a great opportunity to see how this very large um mass event could impact the way people thought about the catholic supernatural so that's so that's those are the precursor communities that i was embedded in prior to doing ufo research was there, did you see a direct line between The Conjuring and the apparitions of the Virgin Mary? Like the plot? Or in, in I, I was thinking more in terms of the aftermath, because you're saying that what we see in movies and in these screen representations then feeds back on the way that people actually act in, in, in the world. Yes, I did. And that's when, so once I started to study media, um, I started to recognize what Dr. Haraway was trying to get me to understand, and which I just was too, at the time, too green, too naive to understand. And that's when I did a lot of work in co uh, basically cognitive science, studying how even if we think that we're going to a movie and we know it's fiction, and we say, well, that's silly, I wouldn't believe this. Our bodies are reacting as if we believe it. We go home and we turn the light on. We don't want to sleep with the light off, you know, in the dark room. Um, we have jump scares. In the, in the, so physiologically, we're acting as if this thing is real. And so I think that's what she was getting at because she talked about us being cyborgs, you know, the cyborg manifesto. She said that we are actually open to these influences and they're not so different from the real things that, you know, so a lot of what my scholarship is too, is looking at the historical precedents for these events that we see today, like religious events, like the apparitions of the Virgin Mary, this is all pre-internet stuff for the most part. And so what you can do is you can look at those events and you can see patterns to the communities, you know, basically what's happening in these events is also happening in the, the movie events. It's just, you know, we, we tend to discount that and say there's no relationship. 
there's a huge relationship. And so that it's that space that I started to study. And what is uh, what is what is a cyborg? I, I think I know, but I'm not 100 percent sure. A cyborg is a is a person that's also it's like the Terminator, right? The Terminator, kind of a human, a, a human AI, like a a person who's also technological. Hmm. And then one other clarifying question: What is what's the storyline of the Conjuring? I don't know it. Mm-hmm. So the Conjuring is basically a series. It's a franchise. So it's. And it's the, when I worked on it and it came out in 2013, it became the third largest grossing movie about the supernatural ever, um, just below The Exorcist and uh, The Sixth Sense. And I think Mm -hmm. it's now, it's, it's now the second. So it's really high up there. So basically The Conjuring is this, it's this movie about real people, Ed Warren and Lorraine Warren, and they both have passed away. But they were people who, during the 1960s and 70s, are traditionalist Catholics, which means that they're conservative Catholics. They, they're pro, I mean, they're pre-Vatican II Catholics, which means this, that they believe in the Roman rite of exorcism. And they also believe in the real presence of Satan. And they're exorcists. So they take that they're not supposed to be exorcists, according to the church, but they do use the Roman rite of exorcism in all of these cases. And they, you know, they wrote books about it and they were kind of known in paranormal communities. And so um, they, so uh, I think it was the Warner Brothers studio decided to make a movie about them. And the, that's how it all began. So this, this movie is based very loosely on their lives. And they're like, are they heroes? They go around vanquishing these spirits from people? They do, yes. I mm-hmm. see, I see. And there's something very ancient about that idea, it seems like to me. You, you mentioned that it's the Roman Catholic is an interesting tradition because it has the word Roman in it, which takes us back even further than the Christian tradition. Is this something that you can trace the roots of? It, it's always interesting how these things come out in our culture like we can't let go of the memories of these things, no matter how hard we try. You know, we have a. Uh, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say we ha- we ha- we have a friend we were just visiting up in Portland that's working on a on a fantasy film right now, and it also has this underworld aspect to it, where there's this dark forest that the heroes go into and face all of their fears and all of this, and it's just such an ancient. It occurs to me as such an ancient idea. Uh, it, do, did you trace that back as well in, in this film? Well, I look at the pre, I mean, I'm actually teaching a little bit about pre-Socratics right now, you know, the Socratic tradition and uh, the Greek myth, you know, and literally it seems that these kind of travel through time and take on different, you know, uh, just different, pro, you know, different pronouns. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like they're... Like, <laughs> it's like we can't get rid of them, right? Like no, they're no, they're no, somehow no. baked into us. It's like a knowledge we have we don't know we have or something. Exactly. I think so. I mean, they seem to be um like Carl Jung would call them archetypes, right? So he would say that they're archetypes, which means that they pre-exist us in a sense um and that we they're they're part of us. Just like you said, they're baked in somehow. And if you look at our tradition, you know, I, I, okay, so I want to just problematize that just for a minute, because this idea, I agree with you absolutely 100% for the Western tradition. But mm. once I start to encounter, like, indigenous ontologies, and people from indigenous cultures who have different ways of being, right, I don't encounter the same kinds of what you'd call Jungian archetypes. So mm. I'm not necess- so I don't quite know if they are specific to our Western tradition, or, um, yeah, I mean, you certainly see them in, say, Japanese culture and things like that. You see very similar types of heroes, right? And gods and goddesses. Um, but when you look at indigenous, I mean, indigenous ontologies, which is what I'm kind of doing now, um, I'm, I hesitate to kind of make that cross-cultural, you know. So well, whether- you might not see the heroes, maybe, but one thing I have, I've been studying this because I, I was teaching just an intro astronomy class this year. And I was really digging deep into the past, trying to understand how our ancestors around the world saw the stars. And what really struck me was that the, the dramas that played out did share 
a great deal of similarity. While the characters maybe might be different, the stories that we might tell about Venus in Mesopotamia versus the ones that people were telling in Mesoamerica had different characters, but they were still involved playing out this drama of this descent into the underworld and this wrestling with some sort of spiritual, you know, version of the, of the self, perhaps. And, of course, the characters may be more culturally uh, contextualized, but it seems like there there are some deep human needs to tell uh, these, these overarching stories of reality that are somehow more real than than anything else at some fundamental level. Mm -hmm. I think that's excellent, excellent observation. Um, I, I did just finish a book by Tyson Yunkaporta, who is indigenous Australian, and he writes about how the Pleiades, the seven stars, right, in the sky, he said that in, in almost every culture, they're all called seven sisters somehow. And he says, how is that? You know what? So he just poses the question, just as you are, you know, but isn't there well, six of them? Well, <laughs> there are actually two stars. They're very close together. I see. Um, there will be six of them. <laughs> there will definitely look like six of them very soon. They're moving. But yeah, it's it's quite... It, that one's interesting. And there's actually Aboriginal tribes. I, I don't know the names in Australia that have similar stories about the Taurus and Orion and the hunter playing out. And they're the same ones we see on the other side of the ocean over here and uh, deep within the caves of, of France, the prehistoric caves. It's it's really quite fascinating. Uh, it makes you wonder why there aren't more ways to tell the story about three stars in a row up in the sky, but it seems, or, or s seven sisters, as it were. And, and and then you have to ask, is that a, is that a, is that a inherited body of knowledge out of, is it an out of Africa kind of thing? Or is it literally just that we have these dramas playing out inside of us because we're human and we map them similarly onto what we see in the sky. I don't know how you separate those two out. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's a um, that's what Tyson was trying to point out. He's like, you know, what does this mean that at some point we all shared these traditions with each other and then went on our different ways across the globe? Or is there, you know, something more basic to our physiology or, or consciousness or something like that? And I think these are really good questions that I don't have answers for. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I, I have this tendency of thinking that it might even reach beyond the dawn of humans. Like I was telling, the, uh, we were we were in San Diego and we were in this kind of like chaparral area and we were just kind of sitting and looking out over the rocks and a plane passed overhead and these these coyote pups started howling at the plane. And there's this moment where I, I can conceptualize it as being a cultural experience that they have with something that is bigger than themselves that, you know, we, we tend to look at animals as not having these sorts of mythological experiences, but it seems like because there are such ancient human stories that are uh, convergent across the globe. You can model it as being something that emerges from an animal consciousness rather than from a human consciousness because, like it or not, animals are perceiving and they are seeing things and they are communicating with each other and there's not a ton of study on it, but every time that somebody looks, it seems like they find more and more and more and more. And so it seems to me that the, the underworld story would be applicable to animals as much as it is applicable to humans. Fascinating. I think that's a observation. <laughs> I'm fast. I mean, I've always been fascinated by animal languages and I do think that's the future in terms of this UFO study. Mm. So I think that bringing that up is, is just, so this would be something that's like proto human, pre human type. Fascinating. And, you know, people in religious studies actually do say that, religion predates homo sapiens. Mm. The reason they say that is because um, archaeologists and paleontologists have found that Neanderthal communities actually had funerary uh, rituals, which would indicate that they believed in some, somewhat of an afterlife or something like that. Mm. Mm. At least some sense of there being a sacredness to human life as it passes. Something that's untouchable, something that's beyond them. 
<laughs> yeah, do you know Anthony Avini by any chance? No, I don't. He's a an archaeoastronomer. I think he was one of the first archaeoastronomers. Um, he he just retired from Colgate, and we had the pleasure of sitting down with him over the weekend. And he he's also examining some of these questions. Um, I think you would really enjoy his work. And uh, you know, one thing he keeps coming back to is this idea that we have a tendency when we think about aliens and life on other planets, which is, of course, the most popular subject in astronomy, that we really are imagining versions of ourselves as these creatures, and that our imagination seems somehow limited to who we are and how we would encounter other worlds, whereas perhaps the things that we should be looking for are, 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 are more of a Maybe we can learn from different cultures, particularly indigenous cultures, about how they view others in a different way than this uh, extractive way that we tend to think about conquering different star systems and how our myths play out, you know, Star Wars and things like this. I absolutely agree with that. I think that that's probably where this study is going. Uh, what I see is that, uh, do you know John Mack? He was the, okay, so John Mack, was a Harvard psychiatrist. Um, he was a research professor in Harvard at Harvard, and he had won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for his work. And in the 80s and 90s, he did one of the major first academic studies of UFO narratives of people who believe that they were in contact with what we call inhabitants of UFOs, now called UAPs. And his work was really, really interesting because he, what he found was that, you know, he thought at first that these people were, they had a pathology, right? Because he's a psychiatrist. And what he found was that they were absolutely normal. And um, that's, he, he then published a book which became a bestseller and it's called Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. And then he's, he did a lot of further research. And thankfully his research went in a direction that I agree with, which is that he said, wow, most cultures around the world, in fact, most indigenous cultures believe that they're already in contact with mm. star nation, people from star nations. And so he started to study that. He unfortunately was, um, he died before he could do that. But I think that that's a natural progression. I think that as a person who studies this, we have to understand that people have always felt this way. Like a lot of um, cultures, even the Irish culture, um, identify their roots as being from the stars, right? That, you know, well, back in the day, you know, these these star people showed up and this is how we got here type of thing. And so I think that, and, and a lot of indigenous communities believe that they're still in contact with star members of star nations. So I think we need to like talk to them <laughs> and, and because we have a, what's called a settler narrative. So a lot of people I met and, and I know so many people now in the Air Force, the United States Air Force, and you know um, the Department of Defense and our Space Force, who all are making this a military, are doing the military spin on this, and most likely it's because of their position and their beliefs. You know how they believe this would be, and they believe. You know they they constantly tell a colonial narrative. They basically say if we are in contact with these things, and they are out there, we've seen them. You know, we've got to be careful because they will take us over and, you know, we will be beholden to them and they'll, you know, it's, it's this settler narrative. It's this colonial narrative. And that's not the narrative of indigenous, but many indigenous people, not all, of course, but some who believe that they are in contact. So I think that, that it's an interesting, you know, we have to understand that we interpret contact based on our own biases. Yeah, we've never been conquered, which is interesting in the West, exactly, <laughs> um, which I think is really interesting because we talk, we talked to a lot of scholars of Mayan history and archaeologists recently, and it's really interesting that the, well, and not just Mayans, but Mesoamericans in general, it's interesting that particularly the Aztecs grew up in the shadow of this abandoned civilization, Teotihuacan, and it was, it's something that's very hard for us to imagine in the West if there was just an abandoned megalopolis next to San Francisco, and you had this sense of cyclicity to civilization where, 
you know, there, you inherit all this knowledge maybe, but it's kind of fuzzy and you, you kind of learn, you, you have these seeds of culture that remain, but you're kind of reimagining and rediscovering it all at the same time. And I, I wonder if that's, that's part of what plays into the way that we tell these stories about these apparitions in the sky at this point. I think so. Yeah. So, um, I mean, when I went into the study of UFOs, it was in 2012. So I just finished a bunch of work on other worlds in Catholic history, like purgatory and such, and did those publications. And um, I had a long list of these narratives of people traveling to, of uh, you know, basically either seeing things in the sky, um, because, you know, I did a lot of archival research. And so I had a big log of these records from, 1200, 1400, 1800, you know, throughout time in Catholic history, European Catholic history, and then Canadian history. And, you know, so um, I asked a friend of mine, I said, what do you think of this stuff? I wasn't thinking about UFOs at all. And I said, what do you think of this? And he looked it over and he said, it reminds me of Steven Spielberg. And I was like, what? And he said, it reminds me of UFOs. And I thought, that's crazy. So I, I discounted it entirely. But there was a this is how this works sometimes. So there was a, a UFO conference that week in my town and I decided to go to it. And when I went to the conference, I heard people talk about their own experiences, right? And they were basically talking about stuff that looked like it was part of my, what I had recorded. And that's what got me interested in looking at UFO culture. So I said, you know, this should be pretty easy, right? This should be a pretty easy book to write because it's not hard to take all the skills and the framework that I used for this other, these other projects and just bring it over to the UFO topic. But immediately upon starting it, I recognized it was going to be research that was so strange. I, don't, I didn't actually think I was prepared for it. So as soon as I got into it, um, I started to recognize that there were actually scientists, like the highest caliber scientists studying and it seemingly being part of these programs that the government was funding. And I couldn't believe it. Um, in fact, I couldn't believe it so much that one of the scientists said, I'm taking you to New Mexico and we're going to go to a UFO crash site and it's going to change how you think about this. And of course, I was like, <laughs> very odd, but I did it. And um, I took a friend of mine who's at, he's a Stanford uh, professor. And he's a bio, uh, he does genetic stuff and microbiology. He's really well known. His name is Dr. Gary Nolan. And I made these people pseudonyms in my book because the U.S. government hadn't yet come out with the Pentagon report, which, which came out in 2021, which basically said, yes, we've had these programs and yes, we've been studying it. So my book, in a sense, was about that, but I literally could not believe it. So in the book, I, I'm the person who's completely an atheist with respect to this. I go in and I'm surrounded by all of these first rate scientists who are definitely not atheists and think that I'm an idiot if I am. And so that's the story of, of basically what happened. And it was a very strange story because not only were there, you know, scientists, but there were also people from CIA and FBI. I've had many conversations with people in the FBI. Uh, a lot of people from the CIA became strangely friends. And um, so it was it was something that took getting used to. And and then the the uh, I don't know if you're aware, but there was a big break breaking story in The New York Times in 2017 about the very thing that my book was about. And the people that wrote the, that article actually got in touch with me and asked me to name the scientists who were pseudonyms in my book. And I said I couldn't. And so we had like, we had series of conversations for months about, will you name these people? Will you name these people? And uh, now since, the, and I was, you know, I thought this was not very nice because no, I'm not gonna name them. <laughs> they should know this. Um, it turns out that I'm now friends with those people, the, uh, the two authors of uh, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. Um, we're friendly now, but at the time, uh, it was just a wild time. I mean, it's just been more wild as we go. So, yeah. So I think that um, my position, so I'm writing, I've written a new book about it and I've turned the lens. I've done what John Mack did, which is I went from looking at it as something that I didn't believe in 
to now talking to people who who believe they're in contact. And a lot of these people are indigenous people from indigenous cultures. Now, uh, you know, they're suspicious of talking to anybody who's studying this, right? Because they think they're going to be discounted. And, and they have been. I think that one of the reasons that people tend to discount it is because the evidence seems to be so ephemeral. Like we talked to Massimo Teodorani a little while oh, ago yeah. for the podcast. Yeah, I know. And yeah, I think he comes up he comes up in your book uh pretty early on. And so yeah. Yeah. It, it was it the goal of the of what he's working on right now is to be able to create a collection of high resolution reputable images of these phenomena but they haven't gotten there yet and i think that that's what's so weird is that when you start looking into it, when you start looking into the phenomenon from the standpoint of regular rational scientific discourse the first thing that you ask for is okay show me the evidence and the evidence tends to be very murky or very hidden or very ephemeral. And so it makes for a difficult thing for people from the outside to believe in because if they haven't had a direct experience with it, and most people haven't, they look at it as something that just lacks the, the necessary substance f for them to sink their teeth into. Absolutely. I totally agree. I don't disagree at all. That's what makes it something really interesting to people who study religion. Because you know, we tend to study beliefs and practices for which people have no evidence, right? And so that's what made UFO subcultures or cultures interesting to me. Because I, I said to myself, of course, we have to study this because it's very much like a religion. And in fact, it is. It is. And so yes. you were talking about this in the beginning um, about how this is religious like because you know western society has kind of lost its way with respect you know we no longer believe in the ways that we did say 100 years ago 200 years ago so that hole then how does it get you know the, how, how do we fill that hole and here we have aliens and ufos so do you do, to, to connect it back to what you were saying about uh donna haraway and the cyborg manifesto and the fracturing of society do you think that the uf the ufo phenomenon is just one aspect that is fulfilling that need for belief and there are other things that are comparable yes absolutely so um okay so in my field there there's this recognition that people are now being spiritual and not religious, okay? So especially younger people, the growth of the category of spiritual and not religious is, is huge. I mean, it's, it's every year it gets bigger and bigger. And we know that in the United States because we have a census where people can click, you know, what religion are you, you know, Catholic, Jewish, and then other, right? And so a lot of times they put down, I'm spiritual, you know, not religious. Um, so that's actually a category now, you know, and so what does this mean? It means that people have, you know, the belief and use of tarot, right? And astrology, you know, this type, these kinds of new, well, people call them new age. They've been around for a long time, but, you know, people are appropriating these, um, what, what we call fringe practices and, you know, and creating communities around them. We also have new religious movements and we have new religious movements specifically around the UFO. So Nation of Islam is a very good example of uh, a religious movement that was prompted by a UF, people don't know this actually, people who are not Nation of Islam don't know, but that religion is a you know, came from a UFO experience, an experience of a UFO, the mothership. Mm. Mm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Can you say more? Can you say more about that myth? Yeah, sure. So the founder of Nation of Islam um, had, and this is in the early 20th century. So this is in like 1906, 1910, uh, much earlier than Roswell and much earlier than, um, uh, Kenneth Arnold's sighting. So 1947 is generally thought to be 
the beginning of the flying saucer mythology. Uh, but flying saucers were around way before that. And especially in communities that, well, the Nation of Islam is a, a specifically African American community, a religious community. It is international, but it began here in the United States. And a lot of the, uh, it began as a, as a basically a black nationalist movement in the sense that um, it was pro helping black people here in the United States survive racism. And um, the initiatory sacred event that, um, that instigated the founder um, was this UFO event, was seeing a UFO and identifying it as a, well, he had a very palpable um, experience. And he basically said that, you know, the UFO was going to come during an apocalyptic end time, which, by the way, they believe is now. And this end time was going to basically take out the bad people, right? Just like in, you know, the kind of uh, very, what you'd call like hegemonic, hegemonic apocalyptic narratives of Christianity, um, certain forms of Christianity. And so... Um, it would come and restore basically black society to its rightful place and basically uh, white people were, were not all white people, but colonialist white people would, would be the bad guys in this scenario. And they would, they would, they, it would not go well at the end time for them. And this would be, this would happen with uh, respect to UFOs. So the mothership is a giant UFO and it has all these little UFOs that come out of it. And this is what will then inaugur the end time. And now that they're seeing all, you know, what's happening right now is like an almost near hysteria with respect to sightings of UFOs. And the media is saturated with these. And so people who are members of Nation of Islam see this and say, wow, it's really happening. You know, people can see now that it's actually really happening. We've always said it would. Do you, oh, go ahead. No, that's so fascinating. Do the indigenous traditions align, are there shared narratives? Like where did, who was the founder by the way? Was it Louis Farrakhan? No, it's not. Um, okay. He is the person who's the, so there are different, uh, so it actually factioned off after its beginning roots in um, Farrakhan is the head of one of the factions, the main faction, the, like a dominant faction. Got it. Uh, but it was, um, I think it's Elijah Muhammad is the mm-hmm. founder. I could be wrong. So nation of Islam scholars out there, please. <laughs> They'll tell us in the comments section for sure. Um, but no, I'm curious if that was adapted from other traditions or what kind of uh, mythology the founder was exposed to or, or what other parallels there are because you, you mentioned there was indigenous uh, belief in the star people and it seems like a very old idea to some extent of course the history channels jumped you know they're probably an ancient aliens series season 25 by now or something it seems like a very uh, popular idea for sure that really captures the imagination Yes, yeah, so there have been a lot of people who've written about the mythology within which he was, um, you know, he was drawing from. But I think that, I mean, he actually made a break, too, and and created a new narrative and obviously a very, um, you know, some a, a religion that has staying power. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's something hopeful about that in a way. Um, I think that that has great appeal actually the people that i know i know a few people who are deeply religious as well and actually we live like way out we, we've lived in cities for years and years we we're in san francisco and new york city and portland and now we're down in the middle of absolutely nowhere and there's a lot more apocalyptic vibes out here and a lot more intense fundamental religious uh belief and i find they kind of go hand in hand in this really interesting way and uh yeah what do you think about that so, of course, I grew up in uh, the Bay Area, so, you know, all in California. And then I uh, moved to New York for my PhD, and now I live in the South. And I live on the coast in North Carolina. And um, absolutely, there's a, I mean, 
there is a very different, I love this app, right? Okay. And I also love California and, um, there's definitely, I, I mean, even Catholicism out here is completely different than, mm. than, um, than Catholicism in California. Um, Catholicism out here, I would call it a form of Protestantism <laughs> mm. <laughs> because it, it's a, uh, it absolutely does, uh, is inflected with the, you know, kind of the, you know, the civil war is still a huge narrative out here. So along with the civil war, you have this idea that we're we're at war, you know, and there's a spiritual warfare taking place. Mm -hmm. So that's very alive where I live. I mean, very alive. Yeah. Why? Why do you? Hmm, I guess. Yeah. Where does this sense of is it just an us versus them sort of thing that breeds this? this warfare mentality about the spiritual landscape or is it is it more deep than that like there really is a spiritual war of good versus evil happening every day all day and these traditions are just honing in on that and developing their their teachings and mythology based on that okay so i do think that being um for one thing, I think that we have to take the different communities. So if you look at the nation of Islam, you know, it arose in a, within a situation where there absolutely is a war, right? Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a war against black people. Mm. Have we gotten away from that? I don't think we have. We're still immersed. Mm. In that. So there, so, you know, that, so that religion is basically, it arose to, as a real way to negotiate being black in a very hostile environment where black people were literally lynched, right? And um, all right, so if you want to, this is very similar to the early Christian, the, you know, early Christianity. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, exactly. And the yeah. early Hebrews yeah. too, right? Out of the out of Egypt story, there's there seems to be a, a bondage yeah. narrative. Yes. So you know, the early Christians were Jewish, and Rome was basically. Um, trying to eradicate them, you know? I mean, the, the temple was destroyed in 70 uh, in the common era. So when we look at early Christianity, you know, an apocalyptic religion that is there to, to basically help people negotiate staying alive amidst Rome, which is a big bad jerk, right? Like <laughs> killing people in the most horrific ways. All right. So what do we have here in the, in the United States today? You know, um, now that we have the ability to see this kind of stuff literally on our phones, and by the way, that's that's very traumatic, you know, um, the apocalyptic nature of religion is not going to go away. It's only going to get uh, trumped up, supercharged because of our, com you know, first of all, because of the nature of what's happening in the United States, but also globally. So wars are literally shown on our phones. Like we can see them in real time. Um, so yeah, so apocalypse is, I mean, a lot of people think we are living in the apocalypse right now. So there's an apocalypse. I mean, I just saw Peter Thiel talking about this. You know, Peter Thiel is a billionaire. He's the, he's the person who basically, you know, bootstrapped a lot of our, the, the, kinds of platforms that we're talking on and using and utilizing and he's talking about living in an apocalyptic time that's so interesting because i feel like the f the most recent modern memory at least for our parents generation was vietnam being being broadcast on the television for the first time and people actually seeing the horrors of war and there was this huge counterculture mo movement that happened alongside that and it seems like there really was the was this realization that media was tra going to transform everything. And yeah, like you said, the, the trauma of just being able to open your phone while you're in line at the grocery store and see, you know, that 30,000 people died in an earthquake in Syria this morning or whatever. Uh, it It's just almost unbearable to some extent. And the interesting thing is that we have less of like a communal spiritual anchor than we've ever had before at the same time because the news stories don't really tell you how you should feel about it or like how you should process it or what the meaning in it is necessarily. They're just like, look, terrible stuff's happening. 
There you go. Yeah, it's really it's really bad. Um, I mean, working as a professor, inter- as you know, interfacing with this the youth, right? People who are 20, 21. And I mean, you, as you know, the crisis of mental health for young people is very real as they're committing suicide, you know, in record numbers. And so I think that we're at a point, you know, we're talking about apocalypse, right? And we're talking about why does do apocalyptic narratives continue and survive? Because we, <laughs> because they still speak to us. If they didn't, we wouldn't have them. And so I think now what we see, so you and I talked about being in kind of rural areas and having the apocalyptic narrative a lot more real, I guess, than say in California. Well, not now. Like, you know, if I, so I go to California maybe three or four times a year. My family still lives in California. And every time I go, the apocalypse is is a real thing there, you know, because you have tent cities of homeless people and you have fentanyl. And, you know, so really, I think that the people now where I live here in North Carolina, rural North Carolina, right? Um, I think that they're thinking the apocalypse is all out there. And we're the ones who have to kind of maintain some level of sanity. Uh, that's how I feel living here. Hundred percent, how it is here too. Hundred percent. So, to some degree, I feel like there's like there's two different levels of apocalypse because there's the apocalypse of the cities, and then there's also this feeling in the countryside that the the apocalypse will definitely come here. One of the first experiences that I had was we were when we were just looking to move here. We ended up at some dollar store in this town of. I don't know, maybe 50, 60 people. It's this little teeny tiny place. And I overheard these two women talking in the aisle next to me about how they were learning how to cook over open fires because they were sure that the electricity and the gas was going to get cut off because the people in the cities and the people in the urban areas were going to come get them. Yep. Yeah. And so it's like, it feels like apocalypse plays out not just in the cities and especially in San Francisco and in the tech world, there's a new apocalypse, right? So you had the apocalypse of the collapse of society where you have these massive populations of homeless people in the cities that don't have the services they need. We have no idea how to deal with it. We lived in Portland. Portland's been slowly devoured by it, by by all the best intentions, right? Everybody in those cities really wants to do the right thing. San Francisco seems- too. I, now that you mention it, it's funny because I had, I did have a little bit of an illusion that that it was getting better, but I think it's just because we just visit a few times a year now to the city <laughs> and I just go in and see people and leave and I'm not living across from, you know, You're not living in the tenderloin anymore. Yeah. 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 But the, the point that I was trying to make was that in the cities, there's now a, a second apocalypse that's coming, especially in a place like San Francisco, which is the AI apocalypse. Yes. Which yeah. is that we, we started with GPT-4 coming out, and it's this improved model of GPT-3, and it's even better at answering questions, and it can pass all of these exams. Like, I think that I was looking at the GPT-4 announcement this morning, and... GPT-3 passed the bar exam, but it was in the 10th percentile. GPT-4 is in the 90th percentile. And there's still a couple of things that it can't do that well, but we're seeing gains so quickly that you see tech people becoming believers in the coming apocalypse. And I wonder if it's not a reflection that the technology that they've developed is going to destroy their craft specifically because it seems like what they're doing is they're creating machines that will be better than they are at creating machine things you'll be able to make you'll be able to make better programs because you just tell the ai what it wants you don't need a whole suite of programmers you just have one computer programmer that does it and so when i see all of these these assessments of existential dread i wonder if it isn't passed through the lens of a personal apocalypse being made into a complete apocalypse and in the countryside as well the apocalypse is personal my way of life is under threat yes yes i think that the okay so um for my next book i focused on several uh, not just indigenous ideas about star nations and contact but also people who create ai and so i have um i would say a 
became friends with people who, you know, um, early adopters of Bitcoin, early creators, things like this, right? I mean, people who who were at the very beginning of this, and now um, it, they are. Um, let's go. How do we put it? Religious about AI. So AI is is in their view. And now I can't help but a lot of times what happens to me is when I get into these communities, I adopt the way of what they, you know, I adopt these ideas. I think maybe that's helpful. Um, I don't know. That remains to be seen. <laughs> but I can tell you that the excitement at GPT-4 among, amongst these people is like, our savior is here. And why? Why is that? Because this represents a huge evolutionary step. So there is a, now it's an apocalypse, but only for human beings. And some human beings will be able to branch into this other um, branch of homo sapiens. Okay. So that's how it's being seen. And what's interesting is that there's, if any of your, uh, the people who are viewers and listeners and you, um, I don't know if you're aware of Ted Chong's work. He's, he does fiction and science fiction, he does short stories. And one of his stories was made into the movie Arrival, mm. which is about UFOs. And it, um, I think it's called The Story of Your Life. But he also has this very short story that was published more than 20 years ago in Nature. And it was, it's a, it's a fiction, it's a story, it's a fiction and it's only a five minute read, by the way. Um, and it's called Crumbs from the Table. And it's basically, he, it's, it's about metahumans and how it it's literally about the, this branching off that I'm talking about between um, Homo sapiens and what he calls metahumans. And how what happened was metahumans were Homo sapiens who hacked into themselves and became a new branch of humans. And they live side by side, kind of how Neanderthals and Homo sapiens live side by side. And then Neanderthals just, you know, disappear. I think that's what they're thinking is happening at this very moment. I think it's even scarier because they're finding all these pits of Neanderthals. Like, it, it seems like they might not have gotten along with the humans too well. Oh, really? I did not know that. Well, I mean, periodically they'll find remains. I think that I, I've seen this for sure of Denisovans where they'll unearth a cave and there's just a pile of bones, just a pile of bodies at the bottom of the cave. And so it could be a burial, I guess. I, I mean, I, maybe, but and I think that it's kind of unclear, but I'll, oftentimes I think the bones are broken and damaged and so it seems like it's not um, It's not a very peaceful burial. If yeah, the speciation burial. thing is something we think about all the time and which, you know, which side are you on, man, kind of thing, you know? Because yeah. there's something very beautiful about the human being as the simple as the simple and thoughtful and caring creature that it is, de devoid of all of this, uh, you know, magical knowledge at our fingertips and, and the ability to execute all of these extraordinary technological feats. And we are technological more so than other animals, right? I, I, I'm very careful to not set humans apart from animals, but I'm always, I'm always thinking about what is the defining characteristic. And I think the defining characteristic is this monomaniacal obsession with technology as being what will raise us out of the dust. No other animal is so focused on central air and cable television and the internet and spaceships. That's correct. I, I just I don't I don't even think that I, sometimes I realize that, you know, my cat watches me eight hours a day staring at a glowing screen and she just must think we're insane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, remember the the myth of Prometheus. You know, this is ages ago and Prometheus is tortured for giving us human beings technology. And he and I just reread that myth, by the way, the other day, and I missed a lot. You know, when you reread these and you're like, wow, I never I missed that. How could I miss that? Or he basically is doing it almost as because he hates Zeus so much, you know, almost as if it's a spiteful thing. And he also says that it will be our downfall. And I missed that, too. I was like, wait a minute. I thought this was a gift. <laughs> and don't the gods give then they give the. the 
they give women to the earth essentially a, a, as a consolation prize for this disaster from what i understand as well in the in the subsequent myths i'm not an expert but it's interesting that there's like this uh, blessing of this feminine spirit that follows the promethean disaster in a way which somehow is hope like aspirationally tempering the chaos that results from that that's really interesting because there's a fertility aspect to that too mm. you know if, if we're going to continue on I mean, that's really relevant to what we've just talked about, about the, you know, the the shift in whatever is Homo sapien 2 or 2.0 or whatever, you know, um, you know, maybe from in, within the Prometheus myth is, is, you know, almost like everything that's it's almost like a blueprint, you know, a template for what's happening right now. And so you pointing out this, you know, idea of the feminine as a, as a not a consolation, but as the, you know, idea of the continuation mm. that maybe technology will stop this branch of homo sapiens but there's this idea that somehow we're going to survive it and there's this hope that perhaps we will learn to make that future not so grim as the fantasies that we often play out in hollywood you know i think that we're deeply married to this heat death of the universe narrative like i asked my kids this i'm teaching this intro cosmology course right now and i think our cosmology deeply reflects this this paradigm too and i asked them you know when was the last time you saw a futuristic movie that was hopeful <laughs> i mean almost all of them end in ashes or the planet getting destroyed or the astronauts just flying off into space and our own cosmology which is and to, to some extent being rewritten under our feet right now is is this idea of, of all of the matter just sort of dissipating and just, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I wonder what steps we can take. When it comes to the AI, my thought is, and we had a wonderful conversation with Carl Friston about this, about how do you take all of the best parts of being human, you know, the, the, the care and, and the, the joy and the compassion and the will to make a better world. And how do you put that inside of a computer program? And if we can pull that off, maybe it's not such a nightmare. Maybe, maybe, there, maybe the people that would be opposed to it and, tr and would want to speciate away from that would actually find identity in it as opposed to uh, disharmony and resistance, I wonder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard to say. Yeah, but I I agree with you. Um, I I was wondering how how you're tying the the stories of the technological advancement and the speciation to indigenous narratives. Okay, so believe it or not, they seem when it started, I I naturally just followed, you know, where I thought I should go. Basically, I had an intuitive idea. Okay. I'm going to go here and talk to these people. And, you know, a lot of times I would just meet people and then recognize that they had a lot to teach me. And so the, what I learned from the people who I talked to who are indigenous and by reading their scholarship and their work, um, the sense of time is nonlinear. So there's an idea that there's, that whatever happened in the past is still happening and whatever happens in the future is happening now. Now that's something that is some, is not indigenous to me. Okay. So I grew up with this linear idea. And of course the Abrahamic religions all have a linear idea of history. Okay. There's a beginning, there's a creation story, and then there's an end story. Okay. That's not the case in indigenous, you know, in, in many, I don't want to like, make monolithic indigenous culture but in the like australian indigenous cultures there's like this idea and it's i think it's all in almost everyone in australia that um like i just said there's non-linear time there's a much more i would call it sophisticated understanding of time because it accords with what the heck we know you know in physics uh so it's a, it's a much more idea you know and also that intrinsically matter has intrinsic consciousness. It's not the same as human consciousness. Um, by the way, you can also find this in the work of Plato uh, when he's talking about Socrates, strangely. Um, again, I reread these texts and I say, wow, you know, they were actually talking about 
trees having truth and stones having truth. I mean, it sounds so like indigenous ontologies today, right? Um, so when I look at the people who are immersed in AI culture, and they also believe in non-human intelligence, they believe that that the alien presence is not going to be found like how we tend to think of it, you know, um, like some some extraterrestrial from a galaxy. It's actually going to be found through our technology, through AI, and mm. it's going to have conversation with us through that. So many of them, that is exactly what they believe. They also believe that our brains are computers and that we are a very rudimentary form of AI, okay? Mm. And that we can access non-human intelligence through our own bio systems, by our bodies and our minds. And we can also do it through art and through getting into like the flow state and things like that. A lot of them are very, uh, when I listen to people who program, like computer programmers who are really good, a lot of times they get into a flow state, but they also say, oh, right. And then emergence happens. Like what the heck is emergence? Well, it's, it sounds like magic, you know, it's like they don't know how it works. They say these, you know, neural networks, they, you know, they talk to each other, different, you know, neurons talk to each other. And how do they do that? Yeah, that's emergence. What's emergence? Magic? Yeah, it's kind of the question, where do ideas come from? You know, I do a lot of music and it's the same thing. It's like, I can just play sometimes and then all of a sudden, if I, if I can get myself to stop thinking, these ideas will just come to me. And, and it's very much everyone who's a musician who's listening will have some relation to this experience of just feeling like an antenna at some point. Yeah. And I guess it happens in science too. Like or the best, writing or poetry yeah, or yeah, like any, any of, of these the, arts. You, you I, sit down and you try to have an idea and you just sit for long enough and be still and it, it happens. Yeah, and often that takes going and, and distracting yourself from the work to even come, come across such a thing. But where does an idea come from? It's like, yeah. Well, I think that that's what's so weird about the AI systems because as of right now, it, it still requires a prompt. Yes. It's, it's this inert entity that sits there until you tell it to do something or tell it to take an action. And the, the weird thing about ideas and the way that human cognition works is that it seems to arrive without a, a super impulse. There's nothing that's beyond you that's telling you to have the idea. Maybe if you're at your job or whatever, but if you're just sitting around and you're, you're somebody who thinks, who philosophizes, who researches, who codes, you're doing it just for the sake of doing it. And that seems to also be uniquely human is the fact that we are the prompt generators. And you can probably tell an AI to generate prompts. And you see this because people who are working with MidJourney, they'll go to ChatGPT, they'll work out some table of parameters inside of one AI, and then they're going to be able to use that. Do you mean you? <laughs> and then they, they're able to... <laughs> this is how we spend our weekend, yeah. Right, but it, co it goes even more detailed than what we do because right now we use MidJourney to make our thumbnails for the podcast. But the other day I came across somebody who put together a guide for how to basically get ChatGPT to give you specific prompts that will give you various iterations on an image in a very specific way and in with with higher reliability. Because one of the hardest things is getting Midjourney to give you something that is actually what you're trying to represent. And so if you ask one computer program, that computer program seems to understand better the ordering of words and the ordering of inputs that you need to give the other one, but it's still not running on its own. And so all of the panic of the obsolescence of humans and being taken over seems to me almost like a lack of imagination. It's, it's this dependence on dystopian narratives where we see a technology, it arrives, we assume that it'll be catastrophic, and we don't take into account the fact that for all of our problems, and it goes all the way down to, you know, horrific conditions of mining cobalt in the Congo as a result of our obsession with smartphones and electric vehicles, that is still the result of a gradual improvement in conditions across the board that technology has wrought. Like Africa is supported by huge networks of NGOs that are bringing food, they're bringing medicine, they're bringing resources. 
And that's only possible because of the technological revolutions that have happened. And at each stage, we, instead of being consumed and depleted by it, find ways to triumph over it and to find ways to integrate it. And so we were talking earlier about the dystopian narratives of fiction, of fiction and I've really started to turn more towards nonfiction as I've gotten older, because I feel like that's where the optimism lies. Because to tell a story where you don't have an apocalypse coming, you almost can't have that story. What are you telling? Like, what is the what is what is a novel without a struggle against a massive impending doom? It's nothing. The real optimism comes from the people who are looking what's actually happening on the ground and are like, look, this is happening. We know that it's happening. These are the technologies that we're developing. And then what if we took what if we took these technologies and combined them in this way for this application? And I feel like there is reason to be optimistic. But the urge to be catastrophic, the urge to tell the story of we're all going to die, the sky is falling, is the primary urge because that's what captures our attention. And I think that probably goes back to religious narratives. It goes back to, do you know the concept of dread risk? No, tell me. So dread risk is an unbounded fear for something that is not likely to happen, but is very, very dangerous. And so you you give it more psychological importance than it deserves. Like uh, there's this guy, Gerd Gigerenzer, who's somewhere in Europe. He, he coined the term after September 11th because he was like, look, everybody was really afraid of flying after September 11th. And so they started driving, but deaths from driving went way up because flying, even with what happened on September 11th, is way, way, way safer than anything that you can do on the road, simply on, on, on the rate of, you know, deaths per mile traveled. And so we have a tendency to see apocalyptic events and to place much greater importance on them than they deserve, because we somewhere in our heart of hearts know that we're under threat from something big because we have been in the past. Famine, war, natural disaster. We know that these things periodically happen. And so we're we're tuned to them more highly than we are tuned to the things that are real risk. People are afraid of, you know, dying by axe murder, but they're not afraid of heart disease. You should be afraid of McDonald's, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just I feel like so many of our stories are are colored by an inability to just take a deep breath and to really assess the you know bloody and yet triumphant arc of human history, which is that there are more people living in more luxury than we have ever had in the entire history of humankind. And that's not to say that we shouldn't fix the ills of colonialism and figure out how to make you know baubles that we use for for entertainment and for pleasure without putting them onto the shoulders of innocent people that don't deserve to leave these horrific lives but i just i wish that people were more optimistic about it rather than more catastrophic and i wonder if if religion doesn't also especially christianity lend itself to this kind of apocalyptic end because there's all this good stuff about do right be good but then there's revelation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, I mean, we do have a linear narrative in those. And by the way, I love what you just said. So I agree with you. I really like this idea that nonfiction is the hopeful narrative. Because, you know, what is nonfiction, but the result of people who have done work to try to make the world a better place. I mean, literally, that's what nonfiction is, right? You're not going to say, I'm a serial killer. Well, maybe you will. And you know, I made the world a worse place and now I'm going to write a bestseller about it. That generally doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But what does happen is that, you know, like take, take this really cool use of AI, which is to, you know, decipher whale language. And, you know, so people then write nonfiction about that. And that's hopeful because now we, if we can talk to whales potentially, perhaps, you know, we won't hunt them, right? So it's people still in the world hunt the whales and, you know, things like that. So I think that this idea of not, I really haven't heard that before. And I really like that. Well, I mean, I think that the entire idea that animals aren't 
they don't have language and they don't have cognition is consciousness or co- consciousness is is a prerequisite for colonialism and for conquering and for extraction right because yes if you can have an other that is categorically separate from you then you can have an you know underground laboratories that are filled with rats that you're doing unspeakable things to in the name of progress mm-hmm. because you you almost have to convince yourself of that in order to keep doing it when i was when i was in undergrad I worked in a in an endocrine research lab and there was a point where we were we needed to look at the hypothalamus of all of these mice and so we had dozens of mice that we we gave some treatment to and then it was my job to dissect them and I was just popping brains out of skulls for hours every single day and I was I, I was just consumed by the horror of it. I was thinking of an alien intelligence showing up and looking at what it is that we did and how we did it, and knowing the entire arc of, you know, how drug development works and how ninety percent of them don't work. And so whatever we're doing and all the suffering that we're causing is not going to lead to some massive transformational event. Like I can see why people look at it and they they believe that the system deserves to be shaken apart. Because it seems so hostile to this holistic indigenous narrative where I, I, I kind of I dabble in, in right wing ideology sometimes where I'll, I'll like go look what people are saying. And there's this really visceral uh, opposition to the idea of the planet and nature is holy which it's view, it's coded as a deeply left-wing idea. I'm so alarmed by that because there seems to be a lack of systemic thinking about the way that we're influenced by the environments that we inhabit. And I I wonder if you have any insight on that from these narratives of belief and from these narratives of technology and from these narratives of of religious experience that can explain how you can have this cleavage of importance. Right. So basically this idea of the, I mean, in a sense, kind of the hierarchy of beings, you know, that comes directly out of monotheistic religions, the Abrahamic religions, this hierarchy of beings. Um, you don't actually see it in, a, in like a lot of Asian religions do not have it. Um, you know, although there may be killing and violence in those religions, it's, it's acknowledging that they're killing and being violent to beings, you know, that are that have some form of consciousness. And there's a sense of, you know, sorrow associated with that. Whereas in, a, I mean, in, I would say that's in, um, let's see, I was just trying to identify exactly where it derives from, which I can't do. Um, but it definitely plays out in this idea that humans are the at the apex, and then there are these non-humans like angels and gods, right, at, at the top, and that we are here to have dominion, okay? So it must come from that. I mean, this idea that at least if you're talking about I think that's, you know, when you say right-wing narratives, I, I assume that that's the precursor to this idea Mm -hmm. of course it's not if you look at reality and you look at how scientists are studying even forests and how forests you know are living in ways in which we would never have imagined 20 years ago you know even if we tried um and indigenous you know people in, in certain indigenous cultures already know that and you know all over the world so it's like is this lost knowledge that we're finding again. That's how mm. I view it. Um, and it's it's just a correction that we need to make. And I think that there's a lot of guilt that sustains these narratives that you're talking about, mm. you know, because if one had to acknowledge that, one might have to change how they live, I guess, right? Mm. Well, it costs a lot. Well, maybe that's the fear, I guess, that it would cost a lot. I actually think from the right-wing perspective, there's this belief that nature can handle itself. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, climate change isn't a problem because the earth knows what to do. 
So I think both sides ha- have some inherent sense of faith in in the, the co- like the cosmos as a whole to to take care of things. It's just mm. that on one side there's more of a proactive role, I suppose. Yeah. Do you do you, have you have you thought much about the way that uh, the role of the human in context of the belief system is codified? Uh, what I mean is like the. I would say that there was an era of who was I reading? Who? Oh, Francis Bacon. So he he came up with the scientific method, and that's that's what's been codified now as the way that we do science. And he talked about science as being an inherently technological practice, where the job of the scientist was to quote take nature by the forelock, and it's read as being this very extractive premise that humans are are our role is to conquer nature and to 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 harness it and to to make it do our bidding and you see that like we live in the west and i don't know that i've been on a single river in oregon that doesn't have a dam mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you can see that on the landscape the way that it plays out the way that it's shifted the landscape the way that the way that the rivers are the way that the rivers were when say before the the trappers came to now it's shifted significantly the landscape and i feel like the reason that it's shifted like that is because of this narrative of humans as being the ones that have their hands in the reins Mm -hmm. and so i wonder if ufo narratives or the religious beliefs that you've studied if you've looked at the way that humans are placed in context of those beliefs like what role do we play what is the importance of the human are they pro-human mm. are they anti-human is there a place for humans or are, are they just a boil that needs to be lanced like what is that what do you see sure so the people that um so i think the first thing that needs to be said is that when you actually talk to people who believe that they're in contact and study UFOs and U- UAP, um, they're not the stereotype that most people assume. So we kind of assume that, you know, there's people that may be fringe, right? Marginalized type, you know. Um, but actually the people that are in American Cosmic are, like I said, like Gary Nolan at Stanford and people in the Space Force, people who've been working on the Space Shuttle program its entire history, and then after that too, and um, you know, work at SpaceX and things like that. And so these are top scientists, and this is how they view their contact. And they do believe that they are interfacing with non-human intelligence in space. And they view the human being, like I said, as a uh, proto, as basically technology. They say that we just don't know that we are. We are a certain form of biotechnology and we are transmitters and receivers. And a lot of them had religious practices or what I would call monastic practices. So they would wake up early in the morning. They would do like meditation or yoga. Um, They would be in the sun. They would listen to really calming music. They would meditate and then they would face the world. Okay, and then then they would do what um, what you say you've done, um, which is go into their flow state to get an idea. Uh, And a lot of times they believe that these ideas would come to them, but they would have to be in the receiving state first. So they would put themselves in this state. And I immediately recognized this as, you know, very similar to monastic practices, right? Um, People in religious communities did these kinds of things. Um, So I would point it out to them. They didn't know it. They didn't know what they were doing. You know, there's like, oh, I guess you're right. I do do that. And it does actually help me, you know, come up with these ideas. And then they would come up with these ideas that they would then turn around and sell on NASDAQ for $100 million. (laughs) So they were creative. So they were highly, these were scientists, highly creative, highly mystical. I call them mystics. And some vegetarian, um, definitely recognizing the consciousness of animals and the beauty of forests and things like that. So, and these are people who truly believe that they're interfacing with non-human intelligence from a space. So that's where we have to, you know, so this, so our conceptions of what people who 
you know, the UFO people or, you know, what the UFO, you know, the X-Files, it's just not, it's not that. It's something entirely different. So I guess that's what my scholarship was trying to do was to, to tell people, hey, if you want to know about these people, this is what they think and this is how they live. And um, I hope that do answers you, your question. Do you think that there's different tiers of that? Because there's the... There's, there's the people who are really well trained and super functional and are, are operating at the highest level. Do you think that they're somehow distinct from the person who hasn't achieved very much and is being swayed by, you know, poorly constructed fake images? Because in your book, you talk about the guy, I think his name was Scott, who runs the... Yeah, who runs the so he runs this group where their entire goal is to really drill down to what is reputable versus what is not reputable. But you also know that in the era of TikTok, the idea of what is reputable versus what is not reputable is 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 difficult to parse. And there's also, I think that Scott's the one who says this, where he's like, the the veracity of faked images is getting to the point where we can't tell using the techniques that we have if something is real or not real. And so there's clearly some fraction of people that are operating in the upper echelons and they have access to privileged information. Yes. But then there's other people who believe that don't have that information. They've never yes. they've never that's held this up. Yeah, yeah. So that's where it becomes a religion because it is a belief created through these images, right? And being a part of these communities. And it has no actual, um, it's not real. <laughs> you know, it's based on, um, it's based on discourse. It's based on imagistic discourse. And it's based on, you know, I'll tell you this and you can tell me that. And sadly, it's based on disinformation that our government has had a, a very, specific hand in and managed project blue book is a good example of that this is all declassified information it's nothing that i'm like you know ratting on my government about um it's all out there and so um and we would be naive to think that that's not continued so, what is project yeah, what blue is book? the goal sorry. yeah that's oh, sorry oh. The whole can of worms i mean just i'm curious <laughs> why yeah what's the motivation of that disinformation yeah but if you could just introduce the project really quick too. okay sure okay so um project blue book is basically uh, an actual project that was created in the 1950s, most likely in the 1940s. Um, and it was basically to debunk sightings, UFO sightings. So a lot of people started to have UFO sightings. They always have, you know, hey, you know, it's been around for a long time, for thousands of years. People have always seen things in the sky. But the, the United States Air Force began in 1947, uh, along with um, those were the sightings of the two major sightings that spawned the modern age were the, the sighting at Roswell, the kind of Roswell UFO crash that mythology started then. And also Kenneth Arnold, who is a pilot uh, in Washington, um, saw uh, a, a bunch of um, craft that he called flying plates. Those became flying saucers. OK, that all happened in 1947, as well as the creation of the CIA. OK, so you've got all these really interesting things happening in 1947. In 1952, the government developed a secret program that we didn't know about. Well, none of us were alive then. But you know what I mean? That, pe that people in the United States didn't know about it. It was called Project Blue Book. And it had, ha it had a series of other names, too, like Project Grudge. And, you know, it shifted names. But basically, it was to study UFOs because it, once we're up in the air and we're, you know, flying around, we see things that we don't know what they are, right? We don't know what these things are. So Project Blue Book was started in order to manage that, in order to manage, they. so this is what would happen, um, an on the ground type of an example from Project Blue Book. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Alan Hynek. Alan Hynek was, he's an, he was an astronomer and he has a PhD in astronomy and he worked for the CIA. And so he was the head of Project Blue Book. And so his job was basically to go where people had seen UFOs and basically discount them and mm. call them swamp gas or something like that. This was his job. Well, as he continued this now, Project Blue Book happened from 1952. It was disbanded in 1969. So it went for a long time period. During this time period, the U.S. government was studying UFOs. 
And there was a, in fact, Francis Bacon was part of this thing called the Invisible College. Well, the people that had studied UFOs started to call themselves the Invisible College. Mm -hmm. And the reason Francis Bacon and his group of pe of scientists who during that time period were studying science, but you know, science was a risky business when they were doing it. They could be killed for doing it. So the scientists who were studying UFOs decided to reference themselves. Actually, it was uh, Alan Hynek's idea to call themselves the Invisible College. So the Invisible College, some of whom still live today, right? They're, they'd probably be angry if I said, if they heard me say that, but they're still alive doing, you know, what they're doing. And um, they were, they've been studying this. Uh, so part of Project Blue Book was to debunk UFOs with media. So Walt Disney was, you know, identified as somebody who could help to debunk and manage how the public viewed UFOs. Why? I mean, I'm, that's really a naive <laughs> sounding, but I don't understand why. I really don't. I mean, are they afraid of chaos? Are they afraid of public outrage? Are they afraid the public will lose faith in their their supernatural ability to control I bet on that one. the that's world? My bet. That's my bet. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I think that's the question. Okay. Um, so there's a there's a number of reasons, you know, why um, I think part of the idea is this. So there's a lot of different reasons. There are a lot of different answers to your question of why. And that's such a great question. Why would they do this? Like, is it OK to see a UFO? No, it's not OK to see a UFO. In fact, if you see a UFO, we are going to discredit you. That's basically what happened. A lot of people got completely discredited. Even people in the government who are studying it, they were scientists. Um, and their whole reputations like went like even John Mack in the 1980s and 90s, Harvard actually um, ran an investigation against him to see if what he was doing. You know, they were they were worried about it. They didn't want him to do that. Um, but, you know, Harvard has a divinity school. Why is it OK to study angels and things like that and not OK to study UFOs? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. So if it doesn't make sense, what's going on? That's what mm. I want to well that's where the you know that's where these pro these like the fbi and the cia become of interest to people who actually want to know you know well why are you all involved in this like so um i think part of it is that there's technology involved and we are even though we we're not technically at war we have rivals and you know national security rivals so when i started to become embedded in this ufo community um some of the people that I was that I became friends with, um, they were highly monitored. They didn't live a normal life. Um, they weren't supposed to watch the news. Uh, they had to have briefings. You know what a briefing is? That's when one of these three letter agencies tells you what you can and can't do mm -hmm. and the dangers of things. If you do do it, he, this person would have briefings like every six months of their life. Their child would have briefings. Their wife would have briefings. Um, I was told when I went to Italy, you know, I had to do these certain things to make sure that this person wasn't being followed. So basically, this person was a target of international, perhaps some type of espionage, or, you know, that the, the situation was at this technology. So the idea was that the government, this is the myth, okay, that that I was a part of, is that there is, there are crashed UFOs, and there are parts, and these can be reverse engineered for amazing technologies. And this myth seems to be like working. I mean, this myth seems to be real for a lot of people, especially these scientists who believe we went to New Mexico, we found these parts right at this crash site. Um, the crash site was highly irregular. I had to wear a blindfold, me and a friend of mine, Gary, had to wear this blindfold in order to go into it. And, um, the person was a part of the Space Force who brought us there, and he was actively believing that he was creating this technology. He was the one who sold a lot of his ideas to NASDAQ. He was a millionaire. I mean, you know, he was really interesting. And uh, I, I went into this mythology. I became a part of this living mythology. When you say that the crash site was really weird, what about it? Okay, so this is something that was interesting because I published this book with Oxford University Press, okay? And my and I had I've published almost all my stuff with Oxford. So I've been working with this one editor almost my entire academic career. And so when I did and she's the one to convince me to do this book. So when I brought the research to her and I gave her that chapter where we went to New Mexico, 
she came back to me and she said, um, Diana, she said, you really have to take out some of this stuff because it doesn't make sense. And I said, what doesn't make sense? I said, it all doesn't make sense, but tell me which part you want <laughs> me to take out, right? And she said, well, this part where you say that you're at the crash site, it's in New Mexico, it's in a high desert, and you see nothing but this just rubble. Like I, I got, you know, we got out of the car, we took our blindfolds off, we look around, and um, it's, you know, it <laughs> it literally looks like we're in the X-Files, right? You know, the desert and everything. And I'm, and I'm looking around, and I look and I see that there's like the whole place is covered with rubble with what looks like rust, like rust colored rubble. And so the person who took us there, I call him Tyler. Um, I name him after Tyler Durden, by the way, because he's like that character, right? So um, so he goes, this is decomposed. These are decomposed tin cans from the 19, early 1950s because the government put tin cans everywhere out here in the middle of nowhere because they didn't want anybody to come with um, metal detectors to find the parts, the crash site parts. We kept it secret. I was like, <laughs> so I wrote that in the book. I said, this is what he said. And this is what I saw. And she said, Diane, it just does not make sense that our government, this is before our government said that they were doing things like this. So she said, Diane, it just doesn't make sense. This is in 2018 that, you know, that the, our government would in the middle of nowhere dump all the tons of, of these cans. And I said, Cynthia, no, it does not make sense. But this is what I saw. And I said, I, I saw it. I know it was there. I picked it up with my hands. You know, I was, I was standing on it. I said, if we don't put it in, we won't be doing research. This won't be research. We have to keep it in. It's data. I don't know what it means. And of course, years later, the government says, yes, these programs existed. Yes, we did these things. Now it all makes sense, but back then it didn't make sense. But because I did what I was supposed to do as a scholar, thank goodness I did that. You know, my story wouldn't have been as good because I would have left stuff out just because it didn't make sense. Mm. Mm. How did that, how did you feel when you first experienced that? They said it was going to change your life and, and all of this. Was that a real outcome? Eventually. At the time, I remained atheist. At the time, I was with Gary who I called James and Tyler. And I just couldn't believe that they believed what they, you know, what they were doing. But again, a lot of things didn't make sense to me. We did find these strange parts. Um, Tyler told us once we found them that Gary would, that, you know, I didn't want anything to do with them. I didn't want to bring them home or anything like that, you know? And so um, we then had to go back to our, to California and our respective places. And so, um, so we agreed that the Gary would take the parts because he had a lab at Stanford and he could actually analyze these parts. And so Tyler then said, by the way, Tyler doesn't get stopped at airports. He doesn't have to go through TSA or anything. He just walks right through. Okay. So um, we got back and he at, on the way to the airport, he said this. He said, this is what's going to happen. Gary's going to get stopped by TSA and he's going to be um search and it's going to take a long time it might take two hours and then after that he'll be let go and he'll be all right so just be prepared for this well i didn't believe this i thought these i mean even with all the stuff that i experienced when i was there in fact tyler said to me i can't believe that you're not more shocked diana like you know most people who are holding a part of ufo crash you know a ufo that had crashed in the 40s you'd think that they would just be amazed and and I but I just didn't believe it not one bit I had no belief whatsoever and so I was still stunned that they believed this but these things didn't make sense to me I was like hmm what's going on you know, it seems so strange so I just kind of followed along with the method of my my uh academic training which is to suspend belief and it really saved me a lot because it wasn't until after that happened after my book was published after I met a lot of people, more people, more people that were in these programs, more scientists, more tech people that I recognized that I didn't know how, what I was doing when I was doing that book. Mm -hmm. I was just going along with it and kind of like writing it from the, you know, the my own disciplinary training, um, having no idea what was happening. And then afterwards, having these moments of what John Mack called ontological shock, 
or epistemological shock, you know, just going, wait, is this true? Is this real? You know, and, um, and really having some really life changing experiences. So, and then coming back and saying, okay, I have a better idea now. And I feel like, you know, now I can actually think about this and talk about it. But at the time I was just naive and, and kind of really fresh, you know. What did Gary find in his lab when he got back? <clears throat> okay, so this is pretty interesting. So he's been on um, all of us except for Tyler, who's completely won't be known, right? Um, although people do know who he is, but he he will not come out as himself. Um, all of us have been on national television and and you know national podcasts and. I've been on, you know, we've been all over the world on like the NPR of Germany, of Japan, you know, everywhere talking about what's been happening. And so Gary did look at the at different parts, not just from that place. And and the government is actively looking for and searching for parts like that and studying them. Um, what he found was that they were anomalous. Um, in the book, this is how he he suggest he said that, and it, again. At the time, my my editor said, we can't say this, Diana. And I said, this is what he said. We have to say what he said. I'm not mm. saying it. You're not saying it. Oxford's not saying it. He's saying it. Nice. And what he said was, These, this material could not have been made in the universe. Not only could it not have been made on Earth, it could not have been created in the universe. It's that strange. It's that. Whoa. Yeah. And she thought uh, Gary, Gary Nolan promised that he would come on the show at the. I think that he told me to get back in touch with him come summer. Yeah, maybe so we fingers, should save that and take his <laughs> yeah, brain about crossed. it. That's really fascinating. Yeah, Gary Nolan is, um, is, oh my goodness. So the only way I can, I have his text, so I could get in touch with him, but this, he cannot keep up with the amount. I mean, he's just, a oh, I'm sure. He's just bombarded right now. Bombarded. I'm sure. What was the so what what did the what did the piece that you guys found look like? You you kind of briefly mentioned it in the book, but it wasn't it, it wasn't a really lengthy description. So there were certain things that I was, you know, I had to abide by the rules, by you know, when I when I write about a person, I send that to them and I say, you know, what you know, edit this for your, you know, I want them to be happy. And if there's something there that they don't want me to talk about, they'll take it out. And so my description of the parts were edited and uh, taken out. And I believe this was for security reasons. I don't know, I honestly don't know, because it was at the, you know, right now for my next book, I'll be speaking with a lawyer this week about it. And it's not because of me, it's the press. It's like, this subject is scary. You know, we need to make sure that everything we do is legal and on the up and up. And believe me, I'm very grateful for that. So at the time, though, I didn't, I, I just thought, you know, I'm just doing research here, you know. And so um, the parts, some of the parts looked like, uh, I know it sounds kind of weird, but I will tell you, you asked. So they looked like reptile skin that was metallic. Hmm. Like, you know how you could come upon a snake and it shed its skin and what that looks like, scaly and everything. Some of it looked like that, but it was metallic. And some of it just looked like um, it had, um, it was this strange material that's, that looked a little bit like bubble gum that was hardened. And throughout the whole bubble gum, it had like thread that was so thin, it was thinner than your hair. And it was threaded throughout. And Gary said that, you know, you'd look at it and you'd see it throughout the whole thing. He said that was just one piece of this thread, that it wasn't many threads. It was like one piece running throughout. So it looked pretty strange. Was it corroded at all? No, nothing was corroded. Interesting. I'm totally expecting a knock on your door right this <laughs> second. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know. Gosh, I that is... Those experiences. So if you'd like, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm not... I'm a transparent person. I'm an academic. All right? And... Um, I think it was 2000, it was in 2019. So my book was published in 2019, 2020, right before COVID hit, um, I got uh, some phone calls from the FBI. And it was these guys who were going to fly to my town and talk with me. And they loved my book. They're like, we love your book. And I was like, oh, like I'm <laughs> terrified, you know? 
And so I told some of the people in my community and they said, ah, they're like, whatever you do, just tell them the truth. And I'm like, of course I'm going to tell them the truth. What do I, <laughs> what do I, don't have I wrote it in a book, you know? So, um, so I had many discussions with these guys. There were two of them. And um, basically though, what happened was before they came, New York city got shut down. They were in New York and New York city was shut down uh, with COVID. That was when it, you know, was like shut down. And so they never, we kept in touch, but they never made it out. Hmm. And that was the only time that anybody has, has directly wanted to talk to you about it. That's from one of the three letter agencies. No, no, no. There were other times, but that was the one that was most, um, I guess I was, uh, I felt, uh, I felt anxious about Hmm. that time. What what was it? Was it just a weird vibe that you had or what was it? I don't think anybody wants to talk to the FBI. <laughs> you guys yeah, want to true. talk to the FBI. <laughs> there was something, uh, there was, uh, one time I reported something to the FBI and now I can't think of what it was. And so well, that- we got, yeah, this is maybe a story we don't even want to deal with right now. But remember the, with the whole, uh, the, uh, what was the name of that group that we were playing around in on Facebook and so forth? And yeah, there was some group on Facebook that was going to hold oh, the a propertarians. Con- the propertarians. Sorry, not the, to give them press. They were going to like hold some rally and they were going to overturn the Constitution and they had this like fancy website and I got really worried and I was like, someone needs to know about this. And so I was really hoping that somebody would reach out to me. Yeah, my, uh, my Google started redirecting to this strange place in near like Arlington, Virginia for a while, <laughs> which is very strange. Like, uh, I felt like my IP was getting hijacked. It was it was a very weird moment. But that's the closest we've ever come to that. But yeah, that must have been super creepy. I, I, you know, you said you had uh, friends in the CIA and FBI, and I was thinking, can you ever really have a friend in the CIA? Like, do you know who your friends are at that point even? I mean, this could lead... To, I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you keep the paranoia at bay or something like that. I mean, it, it has to eat at you sometimes. Well, I think, so I've talked about this um, with Gary, actually, um, before, uh, publicly. And we, because, you know, he was the same way that I was. He was basically just a professor who happened upon this. And now his life has completely changed. And so both of us have friends, you know, in because you can't avoid it because they're there. That's what they do. You know, they're about intelligence. And part of intelligence is the UFO topic. So they're going to be there. And um, that's their job. And once you kind of put it in that perspective, that this is their job, of course, they're going to be doing that. Then it becomes much more normal. Then you're like, okay, I get it. I get why they're interested. And of course, they have to be. Um, And I'm okay with talking to them. Um, I'm okay with, with, um, I understand. Let's put it that way. I mean, I didn't understand in the beginning and I was very scared. In fact, there were many times I didn't want to continue with this research. And Mm. uh, it could very well be that this book that's published now in, I think it's going to be in November will be my last book on this topic Mm. because it's an intense arena of research. And I don't know if I want to continue doing it. I might do it as a like interest job or just like a hobby or something like that. But I don't think I'm going to do it professionally again. Mm. Why? Um, because it's a real story. And because it's a real story and it has to do with technology. Um, and it's so fast moving right now. Um, I just. It, and a lot of it is dark. And so that kind of. I just don't want to be involved in that. It's too weird for me. I mean. <laughs> I teach religion. I teach about religion. You know, religion is pretty weird, right? So to, for me to say that, it must be pretty strange. So yeah, so I think that just the amount of disinfo out there and the sat- I'll give you an example. So there's there's a uh, an impetus. We were talking about Project Blue Book. And I said, we would be naive to think that programs like Project Blue Book haven't evolved. Of course they have. And they've become much better. Um, just as Scott Brown tries to identify you know, what the hopes are, and we can't. So this technology is going to be used, right? And most likely it's going to be used against and for, you know, uh, UFO belief. And so what I see now is I see that 
millions and millions of people are being swayed by this type of fake technology about UFOs. And that's dark to me. That's dark. And so I guess, I guess, so this is an example. I've been writing this book and part of it is looking at um, some UFO sightings that have happened in various places around the world in the nineties. And so that research, I started this, uh, you know, a year ago, and that research was readily available on search engines, DuckDuckGo, you know, Firefox, you know, all these search engines. And so I would do the research and I'd say, okay, in the back of my mind, I know where to find the, this info, these sources, blah, blah, blah. You know, they could be, they weren't super easy to find, but they'd be on like, you know, if you're looking at pages on the internet, they'd be like on page five or something like that, like way out there, you know, like maybe, you know, 50,000, it's, it's down there. It's like, you know, 50,000 hits and there, there it is. There's the source of info. So I was, you know, that's not the case now. And it's only been like eight months. And so now when I go back and I do a search on any of the search engines, and I tried, I even tried the chat GPTs to help me do this search, and even they couldn't help. Mm-hmm. I recognized that the media landscape was completely saturated with fake UFO news, completely, so that you could not find any of this like real, you know, the the, the actual testimonies of people, police chiefs, and things like that from the 90s. It's non-existent. And it's not non-existent because it's not there. It's just that the saturation is that's how this is being played out. So, you know, the amount, so so if we were to talk to Scott Brown today, I think what we would find is that his ideas, which were only what, five years old, you know, that 2019, you know, it's um, four years ago. It's already passed. That moment is gone. So that moment where we're concerned about the demarcation between the host and the perhaps real video is is not even a problem because now what we have is just the saturation with with faked UFO videos. No one even, you know, you can't even find any of the stuff that could possibly be real. And also those people in media who I know also who are writing the stories about UFOs, I would show them photos of people who've actually taken things, you know, taken video of a not truly anom- anomalous stuff. And I show them those, but they wouldn't recognize them as UFOs. They would just say, oh, those are just this or that. No, those are actually what they look like. But they're so used to seeing a very stereotypical UFO, like a saucer, you know, a metallic saucer, like we see in any UFO movie that we happen to turn on, you know, on video or whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, the clogging up of the information channels is really fascinating. I've noticed that too. Um, somebody pointed out something really interesting to me a while back, which was that like on Google, it says, you know, first page of 500 pages or something like that. But if you actually go down at some point, if you go like three or four pages down, it'll just say, end of results, would you like to see something similar or something like this? But it's it's not totally clear that you can ever get back to some of these things that you've it's very difficult to find things that you found a while ago and, and I've noticed that increasingly pop up you know we, ha- we actually had this really weird experience we had a friend who like was had a really sick animal and was trying to figure out how to euthanize the animal and was reading about um, potentially using Benadryl to do it and the funny thing was when you googled about how to euthanize an animal with Benadryl there's like whole the whole front page of google is like the same blog over and over again On and it different con- sources with different sources and it contains completely inaccurate information that is just not true at all and it's so strange and i, I wonder what how what the road back from that is exactly like yeah. I, I mean if it it's I, I don't know it seems like somebody has to build a completely new technology parallel to it because that one's just completely corroded well it kind of okay i wonder if you have much of an opinion about the relationship between the printing press and the internet okay so the relationship in terms of the technology that changes everything (laughs) because each does and it's yeah i do because i do talk about the printing press as a way to kind of in my book as a way to help people understand what's happening now you know So the printing press shifted, it created the Protestant Reformation, you know, it shifted religious 
um, belief in so many different ways, right? Uh, so, okay. And now I'm saying the same thing about what's happening with digital technologies. I'm saying this is shifting everything for us in terms of religion, of course, with everything else too, but I'm looking at religion because that's what I do. So that's the, that I, so I make that correlation. Um, and a lot, you know, a lot of the reviews of my book, not a lot, but some of the, re I would say some of the more, uh, the critiques that I paid attention to because I was like, oh, that's no fair. Um, basically said, ah, oh, she uses this old tired, like, you know, cliche about the printing press and how that, you know, changes everything for religions in order to make this correlation with digital technology. And I'm thinking, well, how best else can I say it? You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Yeah, well, because I mean, I, I, we're we're writing this book, and we're, I was I was trying to trace the the origin of science and the promise of science, and it seems like it comes from the printing press because you have a moment where, you, you know, your your authority about how the world works comes from the church, and then all of a sudden you get the ability to print in languages that people can read rather than just Latin. It's disseminated widely through the population. You have the Protestant Reformation. After the Protestant Reformation, you have a direct relationship to God rather than one that is mediated by somebody else. And that to me seems like the direct underpinning of the enlightenment that comes later, because now instead of taking for granted that the the world works the way the Bible or the priest says so, you're free now to go into nature and to, to question. Perhaps it doesn't work the way that it's written in the Bible. And so I think that... It is, it, it is in the sense of how we were talking earlier, how the past informs the present and the present informs the future and the future informs the present. There's, there's only so many confirmations that people and ideas can take in relation to one another on the basis of the material limitations of the universe itself. If that makes any sense. Well, it's so, yeah. But the weird thing is that the internet was supposed to free all of us but now, but now you have an indexing problem. We have this swamp, right? Well, you have an indexing problem, which is probably the same thing that you had with the printing press, which is why you have the Dewey, you have libraries, you have the Dewey Decimal System, you have people whose profession it is to go through all of the contents and be able to organize them in some way that is 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 accessible. Because a sea of information isn't isn't really useful because you can't sort through it. You can't figure out what you need from that. And we're living at a time where it, there's there's an exponential explosion of, of the information. I, was, I looked this up the other day. Every minute, there are 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube. Wow. So Amazing. that's, that's 30,000 hours every hour. Wow. And so... What do you do with all of that? I mean, I think that go obviously Google has fallen off the, the pedestal of being able to organize all of that. But I think that what's going to happen is that no one is possibly ever going to be able to encompass all of the information that is out there. I think that that era is done. And what's going to happen is that you're going to have clusters of people that have indexed portions of that information and have built their worldview off of the portions that are accessible to them. And we're seeing with GPT-4 and everything that OpenAI is building is that the engines that are built for indexing these things even now are are controlled they're they're tuned there's only certain things that you can ask there's only certain things that will answer and they reflect in their biases the preferences of their creators and as the technology becomes democratized and you can build your own ai for for being able to index something you'll train it on some other set and so you're going to have all these people walking around that are searching for information in these relatively constrained bubbles and so and you'll probably have people in that bubble with you, but it's only going to accelerate that you have all of these towers. And it almost seems like because of the way that the images that we see inform belief, you're going to have a fracturing of belief systems where there's no longer going to be the ability to say that this is the one tr this is the one truth. It's, it's the ultimate postmodern expression of relativism. And that does seem kind of apocalyptic because there's no belief system. I don't think that the belief systems, religious or otherwise, that we've had up until this point could possibly prepare us for this plurality of vision. 
Yes, I totally agree with you. So I ha I do think that. I think that we're at the most fascinating point, right, in so far, it seems, in history. I mean, it really seems so amazing. And I don't know. I'm 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 a question mark right now. I'm just like, wow, what's you know, what's gonna happen? Um, it does seem like there is a concern about that. And that's why we do see this saturated media, especially with respect to UFOs. Like it seems like, first off, we have some competing uh, space programs. Like we have, we, you know, what are the viable space programs? Well, it has traditionally been the Russian space program and, and US space program. And believe it or not, we have been, we're with them. We're not, they're not our enemies in space, okay? So we're in the space station together. We do technology together. Um, okay, but now China has its own space program. And so it's putting people up into space too. It's seeing what's up there. And there was a point when Tyler, I asked Tyler, uh, because astronauts sign NDAs before they go into space. And I was curious about that. And so Tyler, of course, knows all these astronauts. And I said, why do they, in fact, it was in front of an astronaut that I asked this. I said, why do you have to sign an NDA? And they both kind of looked at me and Tyler said, because they see shit in space. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've never had more difficulty than trying to interview NASA people. It's like the amounts of red tape that you have to go through to talk. To, we've had one astronaut on our show, and it was it was quite an experience, actually. So many handlers and handlers of handlers. I'm sorry? Chris Hatfield? No, it was this gentleman... Uh, oh, Don Petit. Don Petit, yeah. He has a, a theory about the early earth atmosphere and how it allowed for the dinosaurs to fly because it was uh, essentially thicker. And he, he did this uh, in his doctorate work up here in Oregon, actually. And um, yeah, it was a really cool episode. I mean, he, the it ties into kind of a, a fringe idea that we had run into right when we were starting this show, which is uh, there's a guy who runs a blog. I think it's just called like Thick Atmosphere Theory. Dinosaur Theory. Dinosaur Theory. Because there's this open question, how could dinosaurs have been so big and survived in the atmosphere as it is today? And Petit was the most reputable source that we could find who was like, well, it was probably thicker. And wow. it was, it was yeah, really not, cool not like the partial pressures were the same as the idea. Like there was still the same amount of oxygen and nitrogen and so forth, but there was just such a, a great amount of it uh, that it gave some buoyancy to the animals and it, it sort of informed their shapes and everything. And it's, it's an interesting <laughs> idea. Of I mean, who knows, but it's an, it's an interesting idea and it does seem increasingly plausible in the context of what we're learning as we study exoplanets and we learn about how, you know, large planets near their suns are getting their atmospheres stripped away. And there's this evolution or this metamorphosis of planets that we had never really envisioned before we started checking them out. So, I, I mean, that kind of feeds into something else, which is that there seems to be two different branches of extraterrestrial studies, right? There's the people that are on the telescopes and they're looking at the planets and they're doing their studies and they're very, they're very physics based and they're very, they're very I would say that they're very conservative about the theories that they let play. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's a really strong cleavage between that branch and the branch that's studying UAPs and unidentified phenomena, even though technically yeah. you'd expect them to talk to each other. Yeah, you're talking about astrobiologists and people like that. And I, yeah, so I know a lot of them too. And you're right, there's a huge, well, they're at MIT you know, and Harvard, and they're very specifically looking at into space and into galaxies and things like that. Um, it's very different than, say, people that are studying alleged craft parts, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it, there are more of these communities than you think. So it's not just those people. Those are kind of the public facing people because they're the least weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're not going to be talking about, you know, uh, your body is a receiver and a transmitter. They're not going to be using this language, right? It's when you get into the people who are actually the ones paid by the government to be doing this. And they've been doing it forever, but nobody's really known. So nobody knows them, who they are and they want it to stay that way. Um, those are the people who are actually way more interesting to me. 
And they're the ones who are actually doing the work that's that's making some progress. Like, because the other people are just doing peer review work, takes so long to get your stuff through peer review. When it comes out, it's actually not really moving the needle. But the, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of like darkness, you know, dark programs. There's a lot of programs that are, you know, the government has already said, yeah, we have these dark programs. Of course we don't anymore. We're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that's the weirdest thing that you point out these things and you're like, don't you think that's still happening? And people are just like, well, no, not today. We, we've advanced so much. Can I just yeah. ask you, frankly, what, what is your impression that after s having seen what you've seen, that these are terrestrial projects that that we're seeing um, play out these advanced aerospace projects, or do you harbor inclinations that they are from some other place? Yeah, can I say both? Cool. Yeah, so both. Um, I think that part of the secrecy is because of these terrestrial projects. Okay, and I think. Part of the saturated media that we see that seems to inculcate this belief in these, you know, UFOs and such, um, that's also on purpose is intentional. And so that's why, to me, it seems fairly dark. Mm. And then there happen to be people very rare who actually, there are these things out there that we, that are unknowns. Okay. So that's what I'm left with from these different communities. That's why I believe that I needed to get grounded. And so that's, you know, I was like, okay, let's go back to the people who I trust the most, who believe that they're interfacing and they are, you know, they're not, they're not on the fringe. They're actually really, they, they occupy positions that we would all say are, um, you know, culturally, they're cultural authorities, right? Trustworthy. Uh, yeah, but yeah, literally, yeah. But they're they're quiet about what they do. They're not out there having like, you know, 100,000 people on Twitter, you know, as their followers and such. They don't want to be. They definitely mm -hmm. don't want to be on social media. And they don't, you know, they're not out there on any of the, uh, you know, they're not kind of like me on podcasts and stuff. They're not doing that. Mm -hmm. so, but those are people that, that I believe and trust. What do you, what do you think motivated the government to do disclosure? Oh, I think it's because the Chinese are now in space and can see what's going on. So it's going to come out. I see. And other countries too. That's my personal belief. That makes sense. Oh, I wanted to ask you that because when we, uh, when we were going to do this recording last time, it was right around the time where there was all those weird objects that were getting shot down. Yeah. Did, and balloons. And it kind of fell off the radar. Balloon gate. Were they all balloons? No, no. Some of them were strange, uh, but they they could be strange drones or something like that. I mean, I don't I don't honestly think they were extraterrestrial at all. Um, but a lot of people took the opportunity uh, to kind of make it scary. I mean, mm -hmm. really, I had a lot of people that were afraid like there was like kind of like a mass hysteria you know what's going on is this a ufo invasion kind of thing and we've had that before you know we had orson wells with war of the worlds and you know things like that so i think that um that wasn't helpful that wasn't a helpful time <laughs> yeah. so i had to do a lot of damage control you know yeah i can see why you'd want to take a break from it <laughs> <laughs> honestly have you thought about um if you have time, I'd be curious if you've thought much about the psychonauts and the people who are exploring uh, other levels of interaction with the universe. Yeah. Is is that on your list of investigations? Or oh, absolutely. So I did, um, I did actually, I think it was in a preface that got edited out, but I did talk about the people who were, ex you know, first off, not just, you know, this is where I talked a little bit as, a, you know, foreshadowing maybe. Uh, this was in American Cosmic and I, and I did say, this is nothing new. Like people have, you know, first indigenous cultures, but also people ha who have taken, you know, either they're in extreme meditative practices where they are accessing other dimensions. They believe they're accessing other dimensions or people who are experimenting um, with, you know, ayahuasca or peyote or, you know, LSD. And they happen to see these things as well. Um, 
and these things ha happen to you could corroborate, you know, through z these experiences. Hey, I saw that too, you know, kind of thing, right? So what is that? What does that mean? A lot of people believe that they were, they could, like, I mean, in the 1700s, uh, 1750, you know, Emanuel Swedenborg believed that he was being, he's a scientist. He's one of, he's Stanford University actually said he was like one of the smartest human beings ever to have lived. And he was basically taking these night journeys with an angel to Venus, the moon, you know, he was going all over the place and he wrote about it too. He wrote about it in a book called uh, My Journeys to Other Worlds and Life on Other Planets. And this was in 1750, in the 1750s. He was a contemporary of Immanuel Kant. They were friends and Kant wrote about him too. And, and I couldn't believe it, but also knew that he was really an intelligent man. So had to somewhat take him seriously and also witness some strange things that he did. So, um, yeah, so I think that, you know, I think that uh, the what I see is that the scientists who are most adept at doing this type of research, I would call them mystics. And so they're taking these journeys as well. And they're taking them through these monastic practices. Do you, uh, I think you mentioned the biocosmists in your book. The... the the biocosmists. Okay. It was like the Soviet era. Um, oh, you mean the Russian cosmists? Yes, yes, yes. Love them. Yeah. Do so I think, think we're, seeing, yeah. So there's a, there's a cosmism. I think that we have an American cosmism. So that's what I was trying to explain. There's a great book, by the way, called the Russian cosmists. And it's by, I think his name is Henry Young. Um, and I named American cosmic as a, kind of an ode to his book because it's such a great book, but he basically explores the belief of Russian, the early Russians like Konstantin um, Tchaikovsky, who was, did, you know, rocket science. And he believed that he was in touch with these beings, like uh, extraterrestrial kind of angelic beings and that they were giving him th this information. And so that, you know, if you look at our own space program, it was pretty much like that too. So you have Jack Parsons, he's doing similar types of things, but with different entities. He named them differently and did lots of different rituals that were very unlike the Russian cosmos. But they were still these ritual practices that they believed were getting them, you know, to download the, the uh, rocket, uh, basically rocket calculations, calculations for rockets. So I see, a, I see that we're in a we're in a kind of like a new cosmism now. Hmm. And, and I, I see this just in the scientists that I meet and speak with, the people who are doing really incredible work, they, they do seem to have some element of their life, like you said, whether some monastic element, right? Whether it's music or painting or whatever it is, uh, meditation, maybe it's ultra marathons, some, mm. some place that allows them to get into a different state of mind than you would experience normally. And I mm -hmm. think that is really important for, for discovery and for, for understanding what's happening here. And I think that it's not just important for discovery and understanding, but I think it speaks to the almost oracular quality, if I can use that. Like the oracle is not of the people. It's, it's, it's someone who lives apart from society and is saying things that go beyond what you're experiencing on the everyday. And I think that as we've been doing this show, we explore so many weird ideas that are presented to us by people who are, you know, deeply credentialed, incredibly well qualified. They're working in these laboratories and they're working on things that if you go to a regular person and you tell them about it, they, it's it's beyond belief almost. Yes. I and think so, so too. And so it seems like this is the nexus of that, where it's 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 other it's literally otherworldly. Yes, yes, and you're right. So in the Christian tradition, there were these. Do you know what an anchorite is? Mm -mm. Anchorites are really interesting. So they would be the monastics, true monastics. They would actually be holed up. If you go into Europe and you see the churches, they will have these anchorite uh, quarters near them, and literally they would go into this this quarter. And they would be in there for, they would never be able to come out. And so the community would have to support them by bringing them, you know, food and water and things like that. So they were cloistered, literally. And their job was basically to, um, to hold this, when you say this is the nexus, to hold 
this position for the community, almost like they were the um, the uh, the modem. Hmm. Mm. I like that. Yeah, and I don't think that's something that we can get away from as humans. We need that. That's a very yeah. There's a tendency to want everybody to conform. There's a really strong pressure to not lean too heavily into things that are odd or weird or outside the bounds of of common experience. And obviously, on one hand, you have to balance that because there's a lot of disinformation and people make stuff up and it makes for huge brands on the internet that make lots and lots of money from the fact that people watch them. But on the other hand, it's like if you squash it too tightly, you'll lose something really vital, really transcendent. And I think that your work in, a, in an incredibly unique and powerful way explores that and and makes space for it in a time of maybe over over rationality as a correction to the the vagaries of belief in mystical experience i think so too i oh i don't mean to say that about my work <laughs> well, no, no I just, it's a great it's a great book by the way everybody we've just kind of cracked the surface on this so everybody go and grab this book american cosmic it's awesome actually just i love how it's written in that there's uh there's a lot of storytelling in it from your own experiences and it really pulls you through the pages it's not just this list of facts and occurrences and i, I really appreciate that and i appreciate you for coming by today thank you so much it's, i know you're a very busy person and uh, well, thank you, you so much. It was it was really nice to be with you both here and uh, have these conversations, and I've learned a lot. Yeah, so we'll look forward to seeing what comes from your pen next, and and what other aspects of this mythological structure that you'll you'll dive into next. And, and maybe we can maybe we can catch up down the road after you after you get your next book out too. That would be fun. Maybe cool. we could get Gary on, and we could do kind of like a me, Gary, and and you both too. Oh man, great. that would be awesome. Yeah, I would be really grateful if, if you could, uh, you know, next time you see him, just, <laughs> <laughs> just, just throw in a good word. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Take care.